we have found my friend, Mr. Nick Hutchison. We talk about some of his ways to actually implement more from the books that you read, which include setting smart goals before you read a book. Now, let's dive in. Do you want blissful balance in your personal and professional life? Great. What's up, guys? My name is Kerry Jack, and I want to help you. Happy hustle, a life you love, one full of passion, purpose, and positive impact. I'm a lifestyle entrepreneur, a professional model slash actor, a digital marketing specialist, a podcast host, author, a biohacker, an eco-warrior, a martial artist, a hippie cowboy, and a humanitarian. My goal is to educate, inspire, and entertain you to live a life of passion, purpose, and positive impact. It is time to happy hustle your dream reality. All right, Nick Hutchinson, welcome, my friend, to the Happy Hustle Podcast. There is no place I would rather be. Hey, Carrie, can I ask you the first question today? Oh, please. <laughs> we just wrapped up 2023 at the time of this filming. So I'm curious, what was the best book that you read last year? Oh, man. Oh, man. It's putting me on the spot. Well, I, I would say we Arate. Didn't, we didn't prep it. Yes, yeah, Arate. Arate by Brian Johnson. He became a friend and... Uh, I do, you know, I'll be straight up that book's like over a thousand pages. So I haven't fully finished it, but I've been diving into the app and the micro chapters, but it's all about mixing ancient wisdom with modern science to operationalize the wisdom. And Brian uh, is coming to speak to our happy hustle club actually next week, which you should come to, by the way, if you'd like to uh, meet him in, you know, zoom land. Uh, But anyway, that's the book. Have you read it? So you actually recommended that book to me on our first kind of virtual coffee <sighs> intro call. And yeah. I took your recommendation seriously and I started listening to the audio book. I play basketball a couple of times a week. And so that's really the only time that I'm in the car. And so I've been listening to the book slow and steady. And I love all of the ancient wisdom applied to like the practical today situations. I'm a big fan of stoicism. And so to mm. hear some of those lessons, like I have a eudaimonia tattoo. And uh, to hear about all of those things, I was like, man, I am so aligned with this messaging. It's perfect. And it's such a well-written book. And he, he narrates the audio book. It's a really cool experience. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Good for you for taking action. And, you know, that's one of the things, like, we just hit it off, you know, two, uh, two bros cut from the same cloth. I feel like we have a ton of synergies. And, you know, I, I just appreciate the fact that you do take action and that you have, you um, kind of built a business on taking action for others, helping people with their book launches. I mean, you're, you're a visionary, you're the visionary force behind book thinkers, which is a growing seven figure marketing agency that bridges the worlds of authors and readers. You're a podcast host, you're an author yourself. I mean, you're an entrepreneur and you're a happy hustler. You're rocking the hat right now, man. Um, before we get too deep into the world of books and, and, you know, really your story. And specifically, I want to talk about your book, which you've graciously, graciously sent me, The Rise of the Reader. Um, before we get in all this good stuff, Nick, what's something interesting about yourself that not too many people know? Well, you know, outside of books, which has become my entire personal brand and identity and what I spend yeah. most of my time on, <laughs> if I didn't work in the nonfiction or personal development book industry, I would work in the travel industry. Mm. That's my second favorite thing on the planet you know, professionally. And over the last five or six years, my wife and I have visited 25 different countries, sometimes for up to three months at a time. Uh, We were part-time digital nomads for a while, and we'd spend up to three months in different locations. And so I love traveling this beautiful planet, learning from other cultures, eating different foods, and just Mm. having fun, man. So that's a fun tidbit about myself, you know, outside of the world of books. Yeah, man, that's awesome. I am definitely in the same boat. I love traveling. I I used to live in um, Barcelona. I lived in Rio. I lived in uh, Bangkok, all for uh, extended duration, and then traveled from those locations to, you know, neighboring countries and cities. And I do agree, it's like single handedly, the best education one can one can possess is, you know, one of traveling and, and meeting new people, learning different language, experiencing different cultures. What would you say is one of your favorite countries or cities you've been to? That's like asking me what my favorite book is. I know, I know. But uh, That's why I said one of. (laughs) Yeah. My brain always goes back to two places, Reykjavik, Iceland, and I'm going back for the fifth time uh, next month, and then Medellin, Colombia. Mm. And my wife and I love Colombia. I've been a, a few times, three times, four times, and 
I just love South America. I love yeah. breathing in the fresh air. I love the pace of life. I love how friendly everybody is. I love the great coffee. I love the digital nomad culture and yeah, sitting yeah. at a coffee shop and, you know, enjoying some amazing coffee while getting the work done. And I just, I love Colombia and I love Iceland and they could not be further from each other in terms of <laughs> yeah. like environment, but they're both like such high frequency, high energy places. Yeah. Yeah. I, I recently saw, um, Iceland had a volcano erupt, right? Is that in the city you're referencing? Yeah, it's outside of the city. Now, I have an author client that we work with in Reykjavik, which is why I go so much. And yeah. he said, hey, don't worry about it. It's not going to affect your travel at all. Oh. Now, one time when I was in Iceland, this was a couple of years ago, uh, we actually took a small little private four-seat plane and flew over another volcano that had been recently active. And that was like such a cool experience to fly over it and like see from above what an active volcano can do to the landscape around. Just wow. such a, you know, kind of a unique experience. Dang. Yeah, that is cool. Well, we could talk travel stories all day, but I do want to talk about books. And specifically, you know, in your book, you, you kick things off with the, like a very powerful stat. And I just want to like read directly from it because it hit me. I'm like, wow, really? You said studies show that less than 50% of adults have finished a book in the last year. And I was like, wow, that seems like really high. I mean, why do you think that is? Well, today we live in an information era where mm. you can just get on your smartphone and infinitely scroll social media dopamine hits one after the other after yeah. the other infinitely i mean it never runs out and so i think that reading a book you have to delay gratification you have to say listen i'm looking to solve a problem i'm looking to learn something and i'm willing to delay the release of dopamine for a little while and that's hard to do it really is hard to do we have so yeah. many other competing uh focuses for our attention and so reading is slowly and slowly and slowly disappearing but you know what's funny is that like in this world of personal development and sort of business, I think that there is a reemergence of like, it's cool to read. You know, when I was yeah. growing up, it wasn't cool to read. Yeah. Now I think it is cool to read and implement these books. And all of our favorite people, all of our combined mentors, they're yeah. writing books and they're condensing decades of their lived experience into days and you can consume all of it. So I love reading, obviously, and I'm out here to promote the positive power of personal development books. But uh, man, there are a lot of other things competing for our attention, huh? Yeah. Oh, it's so true. I mean, the dopamine dumps from, I know you talk about, you know, Instagram and Netflix and, and how you can swap 15 minutes of scrolling for 15 minutes of reading. Like that's one of your initial principles. Talk to us about how the happy hustlers out there can make that swap. Yeah. Sometimes people will tell me, they'll say, Hey, Nick, I appreciate that you love reading and implementing books, man, but I don't have any time for that. And so I love mm. to start here because I'll say, okay, if I paid you $10,000 to read a book by the end of next month, do you think you could do it? And they're like, oh yeah, of course I could. I could read five, <laughs> yeah. right? And so yeah. they've fallen into my trap a little bit. It's not a question of whether or not we can read. We can all read, but it's a question mm. of whether or not we choose to prioritize the reading over something else in our schedules. Mm. And so I think that, small steps in the right direction, right? How do we make reading a little bit more manageable? Well, you don't have to sit down and read the entire book and dedicate your whole weekend to it. You can just replace a small amount of time, call it 15 minutes of your morning Instagram scrolling, or maybe the first 15 minutes of your Netflix in the evening with yeah. reading a great book. And mm. in 15 minutes, somebody who's just getting started can probably read about 10 pages. And if you do that five days a week, it's 50 pages a week. And yep. most of these books, Brian Johnson's excluded, are only about 200 pages yeah, on average. Yeah, right. So that's a book every month just by replacing a little bit of social media or a little bit of Netflix with reading. Yeah. I mean, and I know one of your favorite books is The Compound Effect, as is mine from Darren Hardy. Um, really great read. That book is a testament to what you're talking about, just the compound effect of, of small daily actions and how they can add up to an amazing result. I mean, 15 minutes, that's it. You know, it's like, it, it, it's so doable. And it really is a, a matter of prioritization. I mean, you talk about the power of intention, too, when it comes to reading. What do you mean by that exactly? 
So I, I started to realize that most people, they're just reading because they saw a book on Instagram or their friend recommended it to them. And so they just dive into the book and they don't have any expectation for what problem it's going to solve or skill it's going to build. They just read for the sake of reading. And I think there are some benefits to that. But if we get a little bit more intentional, we can get a little bit more out of the book as well. Mm. And so what I love to do is I love to set a smart goal for each book that I read. And that's the best format, I think, for setting an intention. So SMART is a goal setting acronym that stands yep. for specific. So your goal needs to be specific, measurable. As the legendary management guru, Peter Drucker says, what's not being measured can't be managed. So your goal mm -hmm. needs to be measurable. You need to know if the book actually succeeded for you or not. A stands for attainable. So you need to set a realistic goal. I think sometimes our goals are so unrealistic that we fail to take action. And like we talked about, I'm a big fan of those little 1% improvements, right? The steps in the right yep. direction. R stands for relevant. So we need to be emotionally connected to the book. And that's what most people are missing. They don't have an intention. They're not emotionally connected to taking action. And so they don't. And mm. then T stands for time bound. So we want to give ourselves a deadline for taking action. Parkinson's law states that a task will expand to the amount of time that we give it. And if you don't give yourself a deadline, you won't take action. So let's take Brian Johnson's book, Arate, for an example. Instead of just reading the book and hoping that it's going to change our lives, instead, let's set a SMART goal, something like find and implement at least one piece of ancient wisdom that I can implement into my daily routine by the end of April because... I care so much about improving my life and I'm going to have my first kid this year and I want to be the best dad possible. And Brian Johnson's a great dad. So I'm going to improve my life using this book. And you mm. write that intention on the inside cover and you review it every time you read another chapter. So you're telling the book what your goal is. I'm looking to find and implement at least one piece of ancient wisdom into my daily routine. Mm. And everything else will melt away and those potential actions for you to implement they're going to show up. They're going to be naturally highlighted. And so that's why I read with intention. I try to get really specific because like we've talked about and like I'm so passionate about, like these books can change our lives, but if we choose not to take action on them, I'd argue that these books are closer to a form of entertainment than they mm. are actual education and behavior change. And so there's an opportunity cost to not taking action on what we learn. In that format of SMART goals, it's a great framework for taking more action. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you're, you're talking dirty to me, brother. I'll tell you what, <laughs> I, uh, I, I talk about smart goals like every day, specifically to our, our high performing entrepreneurs in the happy hustle club. You know, we have to set a, a smart goal personally and professionally for our two week sessions. And then we have money at stake every session. If you do what you say you're going to do, you get your money back and you get to split the pot earnings. And if you don't, your money gets forfeited to the pot. And so it's all about smart goals. And I think I like it's genius that you're applying it to a book. I've never heard it applied to a book, but I think that makes a ton of sense. And I know one of your guiding principles is the right book at the right time can change your life. Unpack that for us. Well, we were talking all about this a little bit before we press record. I'd I'd argue, I'd state that there's a book out there to solve every problem that we face as human beings, every single one of them. I mean, about a hundred billion people have lived on this planet, a hundred billion. That's a big number. Yeah. And many of them have figured it out. They've been happy, they've been wealthy, and they've been healthy. And they've documented their greatest life lessons in the form of a book. And so when somebody tells me about a problem that they're facing, and they say, I can't figure it out. I'm like, there is a book out there about how somebody else figured it out. It might have taken them 10 or 15 or 20 years to figure it out. And you get to shortcut that entire process by reading about their solution in just yeah. a few hours, and then you can apply it to your life. And so when I say the right book at the right time can change your life, I think that we can shortcut that experience of learning through trial and error and figuring it out ourselves by reading about how somebody else figured it out, using their solution and improving your life. And there's, there's so much magic to that, man. I have used books to improve every single area of my life and solve every single problem I've faced. Now, you and I are both fans of this ancient philosophy, right? Stoicism and so many of these other ancient philosophies. 
you think about somebody like Marcus Aurelius almost 2000 years ago, dealing with the same problems that we dealt with today, but he found solutions. He implemented things that worked and he journaled about them. And then we get to read about those solutions and use them. Mm. Now, many of us face the same problems that Marcus did almost 2000 years ago because we choose not to use those lessons. We just go back and we try to figure it out ourselves. And I think that's yeah. inefficient and I think it's clunky. And uh, man, I just, I've, I've had, I mean, hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of case studies where somebody says, Nick, I'm dealing with this problem. Do you know a good book? Yes, here's the good book. And they come back 30, 60 days later and they say, Nick, I read the book. I applied the solution and it worked. Thank you so much. Now I don't have to deal with it anymore. Mm. And I just, mm, I just want to get that message out there to people. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, you're doing a great job getting the message out there. I feel like, you know, it's so true. There's like, first of all, books are a labor of love. You and I both being authors, we know what goes into a book. And this is, you know, decades of wisdom distilled into days of your time reading it. Like you say, you might as well research your problem online and find a book for it to save yourself a lot of heartache and pain and, and, and trouble. I mean, it, it really is that simple. There's a solution to your problem, whatever it is out there. And, and most likely it's distilled in a book. And if it's not, you've solved the problem, then you could write the book about it. Right. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's genius. I, I do want to kind of talk about the problem you're solving with your book, the rise of the reader, you know, because a lot of people read books, but they don't actually like, uh, implement the, the knowledge. And one of the things you talk about is like actually having specific methods for note taking while you're reading the book. Let's, let's talk about some of those things. So the happy hustlers out there, when they're reading their next book, they can actually apply some of this wisdom that, that you found valuable and that many others have as well. Yeah. And, and I'll kick off my answer with a couple of quick metaphors just to highlight how pervasive I think this problem is. One of the things that I write in the book is, imagine your goal is to make the world's best chicken parm. That's your goal. That's the problem you want to solve because your chicken parm stinks and you just want it to be better because it's your favorite meal. So you buy a cookbook dedicated to making the world's best chicken parm. And you read that thing day and night. You study it. You memorize every single word. You highlight it. You dog ear it. There's coffee stains. It's all torn up. You're like, putting pages on your bathroom mirror before you go to bed at night and studying them. Like, you know, this thing, and you even buy all of the ingredients necessary to make the world's best chicken parm, but you never actually make it. That would be weird, mm. right? Yeah. All of that effort just to fail the final piece, the action, right? To implement what you've learned. Yet so many people are reading books on happiness, but they're not implementing them. Or they're mm -hmm. reading books on entrepreneurship and they're not starting businesses. They're reading books on dating and they're not asking anybody out. And it's mm -hmm. normal in the world of personal development. You go, yeah, that's me. Like I do that. <laughs> oh, I read Atomic Habits, but I never actually implemented anything from it. So I'm stating this because I do think it's a big problem. I think that we do live in a world where like there's this vanity metric of reading 52 books a year, but not taking action on any yeah. of them, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's a great Napoleon Hill quote that I wish I read before I actually wrote my book because I would have put it in there, but it says, action is the real measure of intelligence. So mm. reading the book isn't enough. We need to take action on it. That's where all of the magic happens. Mm. So back when I first started reading books, I remember reading Thinking Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and I highlighted well over 100 items in the book. And I even rewrote all of those notes into an Evernote doc, and I planned on studying it every single day or every single week to try to take more action on the book. But it became a chore. It became a little overwhelming. And as a result, I didn't take any action on the book. I mean, it was supposed to make me rich, but it didn't do anything for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's because I didn't take action. And so these days, when I think about taking notes, I always start by setting that SMART goal. What problem am I trying to solve? What skill am I trying to build? So back to the Brian Johnson example. What piece of ancient philosophy am I going to implement into my daily routines? Now when I'm reading the book, I'm only taking notes on those potential actions. Mm. So I've changed a little bit even since I've written my book. Like my, my strategy today is State the intention for the book. What, what are you going to implement from it? What is your goal? And then as you're reading, only take notes or highlight 
the things in the book that are going to, you know, those actions that you can take. And in Brian's book, there are a lot. In other books, there are less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, then when I get to the end of my reading experience, I'm going to write down all of those potential actions. And I'm going to say, okay, here are the 10 things I could implement. What one or two things are easiest to implement, most cost effective, are going to create the most change, right? Not every action is created equal. So I recommend finishing a book before you start taking action because sometimes you get really excited about something. But the strategy on the next page is like five times more effective and costs half as much. <laughs> yeah. And so get to the end of the book, do a quick 80-20 analysis and say what 20% of these actions are going to create 80% of the change and cost half as much. And that's what I choose to implement. So the note-taking piece is kind of funny, but I only take notes on those actions that I'm going to implement because everything else kind of gets lost over time. Yeah. Yeah, you're so you're so right because, I mean – First of all, I have friends, and I know, I'm sure you do too, they have every certification under the sun. I mean, I know one friend specifically I'm thinking about, not to name any names, but she she went to like Tony Robbins, like every single Tony Robbins, you know, event, <laughs> like UPW, Business Mastery, all the things, but she's still broke as a joke. And it's like, not saying measure, uh, money's the measurement, but it's one thing to, you know, have this certification craze. It's another thing to just implement one thing that you know is going to add value to your life. And even from, you know, this podcast, Nick and I riffed and like, just pick one thing and just implement it. And then once you have that built into a habit, pick another one, you know, but you have to build the habit first. And, you know, I know specifically you talk about a hundred new habits to improve your health, your wealth, and your happiness. and I want to get into all three, um, but specifically happiness. I'm, I'm very excited. You know, let's, let's kind of hear a couple, maybe three per each, uh, a high leverage habit for happiness. Hit us with it, Nick. Gratitude. That's always yeah. my favorite place to start. Gratitude. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a bunch of people on this podcast have talked about gratitude, but let's talk about it through a little bit of an actionable lens. One of my favorite quotes says it's not, happy people that are grateful, but it's grateful people that are happy. Gratitude Ooh. is the action. Gratitude's the input. Happiness is the output. Yeah. And so when we think about gratitude, like, okay, how do I practice gratitude? There are so many fun ways to do it, but let me throw a fun one at you. Please. Every single week on Sunday, I pull out my phone in selfie mode like this, and I record a one minute gratitude time capsule. So I state to my phone, hey, today is Sunday, March 24th, and over the last week, here are some of the highlights. And I go through just the major highlights, the things that I am the most grateful for. And I upload that one-minute video to a Google Drive, and it's categorized by year. And so check this out. At the end of a year, you have 52 one-minute gratitude time capsules. You have all the best highlights throughout the last year and condensed under an hour. How cool is that? And so awesome. if you're ever feeling down, if you ever need a reset, you can click into a random week a couple of years ago and just see those gratitude moments and see yourself smiling and how, you know, a lot of times what's funny when I do this is like something I was grateful for three years ago. I forgot about it. It never ended up being very meaningful, but like just the smile on my face as I'm talking to myself about it. Yeah. Oh man, it brings me into the present moment. So that's one of my favorite ones right there. Have you ever tried anything like that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Apologies for interrupting your programming. But I have to tell you, the best investment you can make in yourself is one in which helps you acquire skills. You've probably heard people talk about, oh, just invest in yourself and you'll be successful. Yes, that's true to a degree, but you have to invest in skills that will ultimately help you achieve your desired results. And I think one of the best skills one can possess, be it an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur is the sales sword, really knowing how to sell, utilizing pressure-free persuasion, which will make you more money and more impact. Now, if you want to know how to sell more efficiently and effectively, I just launched a sales course called the Proven Roadmap Process to Selling Millions of Dollars and Helping You to increase your conversions guaranteed. And you can get access to this new sales course 
that the Happy Hustle is launching at thehappyhustle.com forward slash sales. And if you act fast, you'll get it at the lowest price it'll ever be available because we are launching it and we want to gain amazing testimonials and social proof to further share this knowledge. So if you act fast, you can get it at the lowest price it'll ever be. That's at thehappyhustle.com forward slash sales. Now let's get back to this episode. I, I love that. I have uh, done many selfie videos like, um, you know, explaining something that's been a highlight and specifically, you know, I've done the, I guess it's like, what is it? One 10 second video for the year you do every day. And then you kind of mash oh, it. It was cool. an app that I did one year. And now one thing that I'm doing with my son is I'm creating him an email or created him an email account. And then I can email him uh, pictures and like kind of, you know, text uh, passages or something that's on my mind or on my heart and, you know, something that he's done. And then, uh, you know, when he's older, I'll, I'll give him access to his email. So that's kind of one way. But I love gratitude, man. I, I write down five to ten things I'm grateful for every day in my journal every morning. And uh, I think, you know just practicing an attitude of gratitude is such a, a powerful happiness habit. So I love that you mentioned that. Let's, let's hear two more. Okay. I'll give you some quick ones. And first I'll show you that on my left wrist, I have a, a well, there we go. I have the numbers <laughs> one, two, and three, because for years I journaled three things every day that I was grateful for. And I was like, you know what? I want a more permanent reminder and it. It always sparks conversations in person and I'll meet somebody and they'll say, tell me about a tattoo. And I'll pick this one. And I'll say, can you tell me three things you're grateful for? And like, Maybe it's the first time they've ever thought about it. So it's a fun one. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a couple more. Collect happy souvenirs. That's one of my favorite kind of odd ones. I think that souvenirs are such a great thing to collect from the events that you attend, the people that you meet, the places that you travel, because they can almost transport you back into that moment. Mm. And I love the travel experiences. And so my bookshelves behind me are full of dozens and dozens and dozens of souvenirs. And I can grab one, like a little statue of the Roman Colosseum, and I can say, oh, I remember my trip to Rome. And I can relive some of those happiness moments. There's a great book called Die With Zero by Bill Perkins. Mm. He talks about the concept of memory dividends. An experience in the past can pay you out little happiness moments for the rest of your life. Mm. If you go back and you relive them, and a great way to do that is by collecting souvenirs. Yeah, so, that's great. I, I yeah. would collect flags, but you know, I just ran out of wall space in my man cave to put them. So I like the little <laughs> souvenir. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw one more out there. Uh, and this one is inspired by Jordan Peterson. You know, I saw a video one time where he said that if he stops for a moment, pays attention to somebody and looks them in the eyes and shakes their hand and asks them how they're doing, it could change the trajectory of somebody's life. He's had people at events say, hey, nobody's actually given me that level of like human connection in a long time. Like, thank you for asking me how I'm doing. And so I love to make fast friends and it brings me a lot of joy to be of service to the people around me, whether it's holding a door open and asking how somebody's day is going or whatever the case is, like trying to be as charismatic as possible for a waiter at a restaurant so that, you know, they might've had 20 people in a row with bad attitudes and you could pop in and be like, Hey, Carrie, how's your day going? Yeah. You having fun? How long have yeah. you worked here? You know, just try to make a fast friend. And so that brings me a lot of joy. And I know it brings them a lot of joy as well. Yeah. Amen to that, brother. I mean, one thing that I consciously do when I meet new people is is do my best to give compliments, like an honest compliment. Just one thing. It could be like, hey, Nick, you got some awesome tattoos, which you do. Uh, you know, <laughs> speaking of your, your wrist tat, um, you know. I look at like the cashier and it's like, Hey, nice glasses. You know, th those look good on your face. Like it just fits, you know, or, or just little, you never know how meaningful a compliment could be. And you never know what that person's dealing with. They, they could be right. contemplating life. Like, I mean, recently at one of our masterminds, I'll just tell you, like one of the guys was like contemplating life and he has everything. Like it, it, it's like, like this person, very successful person and one of a kind just, but I didn't realize what he like the, the, you know, the demons that person was facing. And I was like, okay, yeah, we do our events. They're, they're important to, you know, master my business, mix pleasure, you know, just have a good time. But I didn't realize, you know, the power of that event 
for someone else or what it could be just like your book, Nick, you don't know what that book could mean for someone else. You don't know what that compliment could mean. So it's like, you always have to just kind of keep that top of mind when you are, um, being that light for others, you don't know what it could mean truly. And I just think it's, it's living every day, choosing happiness and finding gratitude for the journey. Um, you, you can be that beacon of hope sometimes without even knowing. Yeah. Yeah. And it can, it can happen in so many different forms. I know, uh, we've got to get to some other habits, but I'll tell you a quick story just cause I yeah. feel called to tell you about it. Please. So last year I was on my honeymoon with my wife and, uh, people may have seen this post around social, but anyway, I was on my honeymoon and we were bouncing around a couple of different European countries. And we were in this small area outside of Dubrovnik, Croatia. And Dubrovnik's a pretty small city in general, but like we're in a tiny little area, population a thousand or something outside of it. And we were walking to this bar um, to like have dinner and we passed another restaurant and she said, Hey, this view is amazing on our walk back. Let's stop. And let's make a reservation for tomorrow night. I'd love to eat here. It looks amazing. It was this tiny little Mediterranean spot with like views of the ocean. It was so cool. And so we said, okay. And we stayed out a little bit later than we wanted. So on our walk back, it was closed. And Mm. I'm the type of guy who's like, yeah, let me just see if the door is open. And if there's a staff (laughs) member cleaning up, like I'll just go in. And there was, and and I walked into this restaurant and there was somebody cleaning up and I said, Hey, excuse me. Uh, My name's Nick. I'd love to make a reservation for tomorrow night. I walked by beautiful. And the guy kind of stops me and he's like, yeah, sure. By the way, I'm a huge fan. And I was like, he has no idea who I am. I'm like, huge fan of what man? And he goes, book thinkers, your business. He's like, dude, your book recommendations have changed my life. Whoa. And here I am on the other side of the world in this tiny little area outside of middle of nowhere. And this guy's a huge fan of the work. And then we probably spent 15 minutes that first time talking about all these really intricate details through book recommendations and stories I've posted and interviews I've hosted. And he was like really getting emotional talking about the impact that the business has had. And so you know, you don't know, you don't know who's out there consuming your content. Sometimes I hear people who are like, yeah, there's nobody really paying attention. My brand's not really growing very much. I, I think I'm going to give up and pivot to something else. And I'm like, oh man, there could be somebody out there and you might be changing their life right now. And you don't want to give up, man. You just got to keep posting. Dude, that's so cool. Especially on like the other side of the world. Like what? I mean, I had that happen just, I mean, we'll go down one more rabbit hole here. Uh, This weekend, actually, in Montana, um, young cowboy came up to me when we were all out wearing our matching Happy Hustle flannels in the bar. And he was like, Mr. Jack? And I was like, yeah, no one calls me that, but (laughs) yeah. (laughs) He's like, I just want to say I'm a huge fan. I've been listening to your podcast for years. I've read your book. My wife and I have your 10 alignments on our fridge. And he, and he said, um, you know, they say never meet your heroes because you'll be disappointed. But I doubt that's the case. And I had to come say hi. And I was like, that's what, awesome. dude? This is so cool. Like, I've never had that happen, like, where someone said that to me. And I was like, this is so cool. Like, you just really never know. And that's why you just have to put yourself out there. Don't let the fear hold you back. Like, take that chance. and you know, our mutual friend, Rory Vaden talks about like you are most perfectly positioned to help who you once were. And sometimes, you know, even if you just talk about what you've overcome, it can just help someone else. And when you don't put yourself out there, when you don't read books and, and then learn the skills to then implement and become the best version of yourself, you're actually doing the world a disservice. So that's so cool, man, your story. And, and it's just top of mind, you know, from this past experience, I do want to kind of, um, mentioned some of the other habits, just health and wealth real quick. Give us one for each. Okay. I'll give you one for each. So wealth. I think it's important to have wealthy friends. We've all heard that Jim Rohn saying you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And I think a lot of people take that for granted. If you are around five millionaires, you'll become the sixth millionaire and don't take that for granted. I think that's how it works. And surround yourself virtually with people like Carrie in this show. Mm. I think it's so amazing because you can learn so much and implement so much and have people hold you accountable to the path of most resistance and Mm. do great things in life. You know, we only have one shot at this and so you might as well make the most of it. So that's my one is find wealthy friends, you know, get around people like Carrie and consume their content as much as humanly possible and it will pay (laughs) dividends. 
Yeah, thank you, bro. I, I received that. But I also echo the point for your own pod. You know, you, you're interviewing some of the world's greatest thinkers and sharing their wisdom from their book. It's it's definitely a great point, like being in the vicinity of people who are wealthy and who are where you want to be. And one of the quotes that really stuck out to me, I don't know who first said it, but it was, if you can't get a seat at the table, serve water instead. And I've served a lot of water. You know, I've been literally bartending or waiting tables at some of the most prestigious rooms with some of the most, you know, well-known individuals and, and some of the wealthiest people. And it's, okay, I'm just going to make myself a value for this person and I'm not going to be above it. And I'm not going to let my uniform dictate my confidence either. Like I'll go uh, out there and have a talk with anybody, even if I am wearing a little waiter apron, you know what I mean? And preach, it's like, yes. you know what I mean? Like you got to just own it. That's your part of the journey. You're, you're where you are and you can, you can learn a lot from just serving water and just being in those rooms. And then eventually you'll have a seat at the table. So I think right. so too, man. All right, I'll give you a healthy one. Yeah, let's do it. One of my superpowers and one of my one of my big focuses for the last five years or so has been optimizing my sleep. Mm. I think that when you sleep well and you sleep well consistently, you almost unlock another another gear. Like you just yeah. become an animal in terms yeah. of energy and focus. And so my best sleep hack has been the eight sleep mattress pad. Now they don't pay oh, me, they're yeah. not a sponsor, but yeah. Man, I sleep on a 55 degree, really cold mattress every single night that increases nice. in temperature throughout the night. And ooh, when I travel, that is the one thing that I miss because I can replicate almost everything else except a cool mattress. And I know, given the data on my Aura Ring, hmm. how much of a difference that cool mattress pad makes. So if anybody can afford it, try an eight sleep mattress pad. You can have different temperatures for the different sides of the bed and vibration alarms and like, oh man, that thing is amazing. Yeah. We need to get Nick a, a sponsorship. Come on, eight sleep. Let's go Come on eight sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. We actually have a, um, um, a, a mastermind coming up with uh, Ben Greenfield. I don't know if you know Ben, yeah, yeah, um, I do. but he, one of the, the whole segments is on sleep on, you know, because it's like, if you're not sleeping optimally, your whole life will be sub subpar in nature based on just that simple fact. I mean, you have to prioritize sleep and, you know, having a solid mattress, having, you know, good sleep hygiene or a ring to track it, you know, magnesium to help put you in a restful state. There's a lot of different things that you can do to optimize your sleep. So I really like that you mentioned that one. Yeah. Um, my, uh, my slup, my supplement stack is large <laughs> and, uh, my routine is long, but man, my sleep is good. So it's, it's worth investing in your sleep. That's for sure. Yeah, dude, for sure. Where can people go to get your book? I mean, I, I, I really want like people to actually read it. And, um, you know, you talk about strategies for mastering your reading habits and applying what you learn. And I just think like, I hope all the happy yeslers you know, heed the fact gone are the days of just reading a book and not implementing it after you read Rise of the Reader. So this is one of those must reads before you read another book. Where can people go to get it? Yeah, you know what, there is an opportunity cost to reading and not being able to implement those other books. So go grab a copy of Rise of the Reader. The first half of the book is all about mastering your reading habits and applying more of what you learn. And the second half of the book includes over 100 healthy, wealthy and happy habits that I have tried implementing from the hundreds of books that I've read. It's the best of the best. And the book is available in all major online retailers. So Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Books a Million and pretty much everywhere you want to go. And if you don't hate my voice, I also <laughs> recorded the audio book, which was a process in and of itself and a labor of love. And yeah, uh, <laughs> I know. Oh, man. That but is... yeah, the, the book's everywhere. And, uh, you know, I'm always happy to send people a copy, too, if they can't afford it. That's so nice, man. And um, I, I want to reference your company too, Book Thinkers, because I know we have a lot of authors who listen to the show and aspiring authors. Talk to us about Book Thinkers and, and how you serve authors. Yeah, so we are a book marketing agency. I've got 10 people on the team. We serve around 200 authors a year. And there's really three main things that we do and that we're great at. One is short form video content. So helping an author turn their physical book into either 50 or 100 pieces of professional short form video mm. to help build your brand and your online presence, yep. sell books, but also generate leads for whatever 
you do professionally. So that's mm-hmm. number one. We fly out with the cameras and the lighting and the nice. whole nine yards and take care of the, all the editing and stuff. Number two is podcast booking. So placing you as an author on a bunch of shows. You know, we have a bunch of different tiers available. Always in front of your ideal target customer to mm. present on a podcast just like this about your book. Tell mm. everybody your story and also generate leads for your business at the same time. And then number three, we have hundreds of thousands of followers on social media and people only follow us for one reason. And that's their next book recommendation. So we mm. cover all types of nonfiction, personal development, healthy, wealthy, happy style books. And we post a new one every day. So we still get paid to do book reviews and interview authors on our podcast because we can move a bunch of copies. So if you are an author in the audience and you want to learn more about that specifically, check out Book Thinkers, spelled just like it sounds, bookthinkers.com. Yeah, definitely check it out, guys. I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, going back to Rory, there's a lot of people who, you know, write books. Then there's people who edit books. Then there's people who distribute books. Then there's people who publish books. But very little people actually help you sell a book. And if you put all this effort on the front end and you don't have someone like Nick and Book Thinkers helping you on the back end to actually share your book with people and create that content and spread that message, you're, again, doing the world a disservice. And I just think... It's such an important business that you're running. And, and uh, yeah, I hope everyone checks it out. I mean, bookthinkers.com. We'll link it all up in the show notes, too. And, uh, yeah, man, it's just awesome what you're up to. So let me know any way I can support. And I know I'm coming on the pod one of these days, too. And, and hopefully version 2.0, we can, uh, you know, get some 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 people out there of the Happy Hustle to uh, to check it out through Book Thinkers. And, and you really do have a, an amazing social um, reach and, and platform. I mean, if you're not following Book Thinkers on IG, is it just at Book Thinkers, right? Yes. Yes. Nice. Well, dude, this has been amazing. I do want to put you through very quickly the Happy Hustle hacks and then the rapid fire round, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, we kind of got into some of the health ones just with the sleep, but you know, for me, it's a tip, a tool, a tactic. We like to deem a happy hustle hack in a couple different disciplines. First being health. Let's talk about something maybe that you haven't referenced. Um, maybe something a, a little uniquely Nick, will you, that uh, we could deem a happy hustle hack for your health. Oh, man, I love to strip down to my boxers and jump in the cold plunge. And I'll <laughs> nice. tell you what. You have to overcome a lot of resistance to consistently cold plunge in 32 yeah. degree water. But when you do, when you're out of it, oh man, those endorphins flood your brain and you feel happy. It's yeah. the best feeling on the planet, but you have to do a lot of work to get there because it is no joke getting in that cold water. So we haven't touched on that one yet. It's one of my favorite happy, uh, happy hacks. I love it. Do you have a rebounder? I don't. Do yourself a favor, order one, and then put it right next to your cold plunge and bounce on a rebounder right after. It'll shake out your whole lymphatics drainage system. It's one of the best things you could do after a cold plunge. All right. I will check that out. I know uh, Evan yeah. Carmichael, uh, he keeps one at his desk to kind of jump oh, away. Yeah. And I know Tony does it behind stage. So I'll have to check yeah. that out. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll order one after this. It's a great it's a great thing to have in your office, you know, or by your cold plunge or, you know, have both. Um, that's a great, yeah, I love ice baths, man. They're, they're the, I mean, I don't love them, let's be honest, but I, I, I love the after effects. <laughs> Me too. Um, yeah. You know, th- fortunately in Montana, we have, uh, a hot springs and a ice bath right next to each other in, in the hot springs that I go to, which oh, also has perfect. a gym attached. So it's pretty cool. Cause it's like mineral water, but it's ice cold, um, and very hot. Let's talk about money. We talked about some, you know, wealth habits a little bit, but specifically maybe, a. uh, a happy hustle hack when it comes to money, maybe something you do to save or invest or spend wisely that we could deem a happy hustle hack in this arena. You know, years and years and years ago, I set up a separate savings account or emergency fund account uh, at a different bank. I set up an automated transfer so that when money hits my account on a weekly basis, a portion of it gets distributed to that other bank. I never see it. I never realize I have it. And I delete the app and I make it really hard to get access to that other bank. And I think that it's the same thing as Parkinson's law. It's like your task will expand to the amount of time that you give it. Your money spending will expand to the amount that you have available. And so by rerouting that money out to another bank and not ever even realizing that you have it, you can't spend it. And that's one of my favorite tacks for 
uh, tactics for people in their first start and like money I love management. That. Yeah. Dude, that's such a good one. Have you heard of acorns? I have. Yeah, they round up, right? Well, that and you can actually have it automatically withdraw, but then they invest it into like a moderate or high or low risk uh, level. So mm -hmm. that way it's not just sitting in an account, but then it will actually invest it for you based on your, your risk uh, profile. So that's one thing that I love to do as well is just automate it and then have it invested. Yeah, I think um, that's great. Awesome, man. Let's talk about spirituality real quick. You know, something that you do to connect to a higher power. I just think it's a, a very important piece to the puzzle. I don't care one religion or another. I just think it's important to have faith in something bigger than yourself. What do you got here? Anything specifically, Nick, that, that you use to connect on a spiritual level that we could well, be happy? I, I think so, too. And uh, I am proud to say I'm a practicing Catholic. I go to church every week and I try to kick off every single morning and every single evening with prayer. And so my morning prayer happens most of the time during my morning walk. So the first thing I do every day is I head, I've got a big 50 acre park near where I live and I go on a one hour walk in the morning with my dog and nice. I don't listen to anything, no music, no podcast, nothing like that. It's just me and my thoughts. And a good portion of that happens to be prayer and connecting with God. So yeah, I'm a big fan of connecting with your higher source, whatever it is for anybody out there. But I do think it's important to believe in something bigger than yourself and to get sort of guidance and state your intentions to the universe so that it can conspire to assist you. And so it's been so important for me. Amen to that, man. All right, let's put you through the rapid fire round and then we'll wrap this bad boy up. So this is just random questions that I ask you and you answer honestly. First thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Yes. All right, favorite food, go. Chicken parm. <laughs> favorite movie. Gladiator. One of your favorite books. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Favorite workout chest <laughs> there you go <laughs> what's your spirit animal a dragon best business advice slow and steady wins the race three things you're most grateful for i am grateful for you i am grateful for your happy hustle community and i am grateful for my wife rachel love it and if you had a billboard for the world to see with your last piece of con content on it what's that billboard read it would say reality is negotiable, which is a quote from Tim Ferriss. So it would say Tim underneath in really little letters. <laughs> Love it, man. Crush that rapid fire round, Nick. And brother, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you, man, for sharing your love, your light, your wisdom, your rise of the reader, all your, you know, amazing, like happy hustle hacks and just all the, the great authors that you bring to light through your platform book thinkers man it, it's really inspiring so just looking forward to further collaborations hopefully kicking it one day soon in person and uh yeah just grateful for you man i feel the love i feel the love and it is reciprocated and, and pushed back towards you man you are amazing at everything that you do and i'm happy that we are connected now <laughs> yeah same brother all right let's go ahead and mention again where the best place for people to follow you online and like maybe check you out uh just one more time if anybody wants a custom book recommendation from me, it's my favorite thing to do to play book matchmaker. So DM me, direct message me on Instagram at bookthinkers. That's our largest community. And tell me about a problem that you're facing or a skill that you want to improve, and I will provide a custom book recommendation to you. Sometimes it takes me a few days to respond, but I always get to them because it brings me so much joy and presence. So oh. Instagram at bookthinkers, and there are links in our bio for everything that you're going to need from there. Dude, that's the coolest call to action ever. I hope everyone takes you <laughs> up on that. Um, all right, bro. Final question. What does happy hustling mean to you? It means enjoying the passage of time. That's what I optimize for. It's what I think about. It's what I'm here to do, man. Just enjoy the passage of time. And that has a number of variables that sits under it, right? It's an equation for me. Being of service to other people, being happy, being healthy, being wealthy, serving God, having great relationships. But all of that boils up to one thing, joy in the present moment, and that's what I optimize for. Oh, love that. Mic drop, y'all. Nick Hutchison, thank you for watching and listening. We are out. Peace and love, everyone.